Yeah, I'll just check his. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we may proceed, right? Sure. Yes, great. Yeah. Um, hello. <laughs> hello, hello, everyone, dear participants of our scientific seminar today. We are proceeding with the next seminar, and today we have two presenters, members of our laboratory. So today we are going to listen to Ilya Karpov in the first first place, right? So he's going to be our first speaker. And uh, our second speaker is our assistant, Alina Labanova. Uh, our presenters today, they are going to talk about unstructured data analysis. So different approaches and probably the most advanced methods of analysis, how to approach this scientific uh, question. I think I am going to give the floor to our presenters. And we may start. Okay, Ilya, the you. floor is yours. Yes, yes, please. Um, and okay, so uh, I'll make uh, a little teaser. Um, I guess everyone has heard uh, about uh, the um, GPT based uh, uh, systems. Uh, Made by OpenAI, Google, uh, some uh, companies in Russia, right, like Sberbank and Yandex. So everybody are doing large language models. And uh, we find that out interesting for um, people who are starting their career to give them some highlights uh, what's happening with the world of uh, natural language processing and how um, a rise of uh, uh, large language models uh, affect uh, this process because um, some people in industry think that uh, um, traditional NLP is dead because we do not need to develop complex systems. You can just uh, ask GPT to write something and get the result. Yeah. So should you? spend your time uh, learning how to work with uh, um, neural nets, how to write code, how to learn math, or you can just use prompts and that's enough. And so we'll try to uh, highlight this general idea and uh, push you to some conclusions. Uh, and I guess we can start. So uh, just as I said, uh, there is a huge market of prompting. So there are several sites that just give you an opportunity to buy some prompts that solve some problems. For instance, here uh, you can see that uh, the prompt that generates some nice uh, pictures of these uh, secret retreats can be bought for almost $3. And uh, generally speaking, so the site is full of such prompts, so some best solutions for some problems can be found here. It's a market that is already working, yeah? So you can find prompt for almost everything, even the translation, uh, the question answering, and so on, yeah? And secondary, uh, I guess I'll ask the question to the people uh, that are listening. So who knows the guy at the right of uh, the picture? Just let's check your attention. I don't know. Okay, so uh, five, four, three, two, one. This is Andrew and G. And uh, I guess, uh, uh, so first of all, he's a great uh, researcher and professor, but uh, I guess he's most known because he's the founder of Coursera, yeah? Uh, and uh, he was the founder and the first lecturer of this platform. So some time ago, we also had our courses on Coursera. Uh, so he's a very well-known guy in the machine learning industry. And uh, recently he has released a course about uh, prompting, uh, the GPT prompting uh, as, uh, as an educational course. So once again, the question is maybe we shouldn't teach our students uh, natural language processing. Maybe we should just make the prompting courses enter and did. And this is one more teaser for this presentation. Uh, Idina, maybe it's some idea for our program. 
uh, because uh, guys from OpenAI and from Coursera did, and the course is pretty popular. So uh, to answer this question, let's first start uh, talking about uh, what is natural language processing and what tasks uh, do we usually solve during uh, uh, this um, area of research. Yeah. So generally, we can split the entire area into two large sub areas and one is part of another. The first one is natural language understanding, the second is natural language processing. And there is a list of some interdisciplinary tasks uh, uh, that are near natural language processing. I'll highlight them in a minute. So usually talking about uh, classical uh, natural language understanding, we are thinking about some uh, complex understanding uh, of the language uh, done by the model. So uh, usually we use words like semantic, sense, uh, and so on when we're talking about these problems. And generally, uh, so classical task here is named entity recognition, where we need to understand whom we're talking about, because there are lots of hidden tasks there. For instance, uh, some problems with coreference, when we need to understand that, uh, for example, for text, um, Mike uh, uh, bought uh, the bike. Uh, it was uh, uh, okay. No, 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 let's say more simple. Uh, he, some person couldn't put the ball into the box because it was too small. And uh, when we're talking about it, so uh, uh, are we talking about the ball or the box? What was smaller, the ball of the box? It's obvious for the human, uh, but uh, uh, a real complex problem for uh, most uh, of even advanced uh, natural language understanding uh, systems. Yeah, uh, and while dealing with uh, NERV, we also need to solve this coreference problem. Yeah, uh, relation extraction is the task when we are dealing with uh, some. Uh, links between um, our entities, for example, uh, when, when we say that uh, Mike bought uh, a new house, we have two entities, house and Mike, and we have some relation between them. So uh, this makes this task pretty useful for researchers because uh, pretty often we have large data sets of unstructured data uh, and uh, to make our research successful, we need to formalize it and to extract some knowledge, extract some relations between those entities and it's highly connected to the main topic of our uh, program uh, about social network analysis because uh, relations are kind of uh, network ties. Um, so um, rest of the tasks are pretty obvious. Yeah, when we're talking about semantic parsing, we want to formulate some uh, semantic senses. Uh, uh, the paraphrasing and natural language inferencing is uh, uh, the question of reformulating the task or the text. For example, we had uh, a large uh, review and we want to, to say it in other words because our teacher would be angry if we are if we will just make a copy of uh, other students' report. Uh, and summarization is somewhere nearby because summarization requires to extract uh, the key ideas from the text, it requires good understanding. And of course, question answering, uh, especially the part where we're generating the response from uh, um, the, when we're generating the response. Uh, as for natural language processing, so we can uh, focus on, uh, first of all, text classification and clustering that are most likely useful for some applied purposes because text classification is everywhere. Uh, some nearby tasks like part of speech tagging, where you need to define uh, what is the adjective, what is the noun, the verb, and so on, and usually morphological analysis is somewhere nearby. Uh, earlier, it was pretty useful and frequently used as just uh, the preprocessing step of the uh, traditional uh, machine learning, uh, with traditional LP pipelines. Nowadays, um, you need it for very specific cases because uh, usually everything works pretty fine 
without normalization and without part of speech tagging. Uh, so, but it's kind of tribute to the previous uh, years of NLP development. Uh, machine translation, the task uh, that uh, started the revolution with deep models in NLP. So, sounds pretty obvious, but it has several hidden areas because, for example, um, um, if you want to um, write uh, the same uh, text in other words, uh, it's it may be a case of machine translation. For example, uh, you have a pretty strictly uh, law document that is pretty formulated and written by um, people who are in judge uh, in court, uh, and you need to explain it with some simple words and fingers, yeah? Or for example, if you have some chat um, and some pretty toxic guy that uh, ruins the conversation and you don't want to remove those messages, you need to reformulate them just to make him more polite. So it's kind of machine translation also. Um, so uh, syntactic parsing and information search are kind of subtasks for many other pipelines, but um also up here in the area of tissue language processing and as for interdisciplinary we can focus on some tasks like text to speech or image to text and speech recognition because it uh, uh, interferes with lots of initial language processing models but uh, also has large part uh, from other areas from uh, working with sound with images and so on yeah and uh, in this talk we're going to focus on uh, these four tasks because we consider them kind of most useful for researchers who are dealing with data sets of unstructured data so most likely if you have an unstructured data analysis task you will need some of those uh, methods so we're not going to uh, make a review of all possible areas but focus on these four yeah and yeah as i said so text classification is one of the most frequently used tasks some simple examples are uh topic classification for example here we have sports politics culture and so on yeah and we want just to sort our uh email on those categories or our news data set on those categories yeah but so for example sentiment detection which is pretty uh frequently used in applied tasks when you're dealing with um things like social media listening that uh, we saw at the previous seminar is also a classification task where trying to say if this text is positive or negative or if this text is positive to some brand or negative yeah, so it's a classifier uh some other cases uh, are spam filtering or hate speech detection where you need to say if this text is toxic to some guy or to some group of people or not yeah so uh, there are lots of problems that can be solved with a simple classifier um the same happens with text clustering. So the difference here is that uh, you just do not have labels defined when you start working with this task. You just see a large group of um, objects in a case with uh, text analysis and natural language processing or talking about documents and you need to find uh, if there is some criteria, some topic or some something that uh, um, can group them into some uh, groups or clusters. Yeah. So, for instance, you group two most uh, close, the closest documents to each other because they have something similar. Then you understand that uh, there are several uh, similar documents nearby, and so you make clusters larger, larger, and larger. And after all, you have this kind of hierarchic clusterization tree. So, I guess most of uh, students are familiar with this idea. Year. If you're not, just visit our program and we'll talk about it. Uh, but um, the key problem here is that uh, to formulate this grouping function, you need some criteria, some idea of uh, distance between your objects or documents, and uh, better um, 
vector that represents your document leads to better clustering and even classification result. Uh, Oh, sorry. Yeah, I have a little spoiler about criteria of uh, text clustering. Uh, some ideas that may be found useful when you are doing applied uh, cases. So it's really hard to say what is a good clustering because um, you can use some heuristics like uh, elbow method. Um, maybe some other ideas, some distances between your uh, pairs of objects. But generally, uh, when you're doing with working with real life data, the best criterion uh, that you can formulate is that uh, you are supposed to see um, documents that you as kind of the supervisor, uh, teacher of this model considers uh, close to each other in one cluster rather than in, uh, in, in two separate clusters rather than in one large cluster. Yeah, so your clustering process uh, is supposed to uh, find some groups, but not to make extremely large groups Yeah, where you observe a mixture of topics. So, uh, and vice versa, if all of them are pretty um, closely connected to each other and all the same, you don't want to have this uh, large uh, cluster to be uh, split into two parts, yeah? Uh, the third idea is uh, that uh, if you have a pretty large, uh, sorry, if you have a pretty large and diverse block or cluster of documents, you'd rather like to have them separated in one rag back cluster rather than you know, uh, just be dropped somewhere. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this rag back uh, is considered not to take lots of objects from your good clusters. Uh, and the problem here is that uh, the only uh, option to check those criteria uh, if you do not have the label data set is just to watch the results and to repeat clustering again and again uh, until you find uh, some good parameters and uh, uh, by uh, um, modifying the embeddings of your original object objects or documents because uh, so if you have some results that you consider good or bad you can uh, penalize your vectors that you're clustering and say that okay so those vectors are different please put them into different clusters and those vectors are the same so please put them in one cluster yeah uh, uh, and this leads to the idea of uh, representation learning, where we're not solving the uh, finite task because so in many cases you cannot formulate it clearly. You don't have the goal. You don't have the best solution for when you're doing clustering. You don't have the correct answer and you cannot check if your distribution is good or bad. But you may say that, OK, so two of those documents are uh, not the same. Yeah, so please uh, make distance between them larger. And two of those documents are pretty similar, uh, all, even if they are in different clusters. So try to uh, fix them and uh, correct the distances. And this can be done by uh, language model uh, fine tuning. So at the very beginning, uh, almost all models that you know that exist in ChatGPT uh, starts training on the unsupervised uh, data sets where uh, it just learns the sequential um, order of language that one word goes after another and that the document has this or that context, yeah? So uh, when you focus on some specific task, uh, usually pretty narrow, for example, if you're solving some uh, problem of financial classification, which is much, much, much narrow than uh, the entire area of uh, or the human language, uh, you may correct your model to understand the language better. And usually this leads to better results. 
And the key power of uh, deep learning models is uh, that you can optimize your vector representation simultaneously with solving your final task using the vector propagation through all layers of the network. That's why uh, you do not multiply the error, you know, optimize it on each step of the layer and get better results. Yeah, so this is just a basic ground truth about uh, deep learning that we all know. Uh, and um, almost all practical natural language processing tasks and models are kind of exploiting those ideas of representation learning and final fine tuning. So, um, just in a minute, I will focus on the way how it's usually happening, and then we will um, dive to some more concrete recipes of solving those tasks using um, GPT prompting or kind of traditional language uh, modeling tools. Uh, yeah, one more task that we have also talked about is named in recognition and relation extraction. It was highlighted at the very beginning of the slides. And generally, so, uh, when we're talking about this task, we want to find some entities. Usually, entities may be not only people, but also uh, organizations, countries, uh, events, uh, for example, currency time. All this is some kind of entity that may be useful for your further analysis. And generally speaking, you're unlimited with uh, entity definition uh, if you know the tools and uh, know how to fine tune them. Yeah, so you may say that, for example, uh, some uh, recipe name uh, in your cookbook is an, is an entity and it differs, for example, from the recipe ingredient. Yeah, so you can train the model that finds ingredients and finds recipe names uh, in some large text. Yeah, it, 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 you, you may create your own entities and it also works. Yeah, so if you have them, you can uh, um, build links between them, and this leads to uh, uh, fact uh, or relation extraction. And another pretty useful task that happens frequently when we're dealing with uh, databases for our applied research is the entity linking, because most of our entities are kind of ambitious. You have uh, the person called Mike, and you have no idea so if it is Mike Tyson or Mike Jordan, yeah, um, your uh, your system needs to solve it because uh, to solve this uh, ambiguity problem because uh, otherwise you'll get uh, bad data to further steps of your analysis, for instance, network building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and somewhere nearby we also have this subtask of reference resolution because pretty often we use uh, him or uh, them instead of Mike and uh, we also need to think about it so while doing this entire large task. Uh, and some kind of example that uh, gives you an idea how this is working is written here. So it's, as I remember, it's the text from Spacey uh, that I have um, borrowed uh, for this presentation. So you have uh, the labels uh, of uh, different entities, for example. So the person is uh, the label, and we know that uh, so Sebastian Thor is a person, Google is an organization. Uh, and so here we have several dates labeled as green. Yeah, so this is typical uh, recognition problem. If we will understand that Sebastian Thorne here and Thorne here is the same person, we may say that we solved this coreference problem. And if we have some link to the global database where we have an index of all possible persons that can be mentioned in our text, we will do the entity linking. And if we will build the relation between Sebastian and Google, we can and label it as, for example, um, worked for, yeah, then we will get the relation extraction task. And we can also do to worked for and date the same relation because we may be interested in this exact period. Um, okay, so, and generally all uh, existing methods that give you state-of-the-art result are based on the you know, transformer model that I will pretty quickly 
two minutes try to highlight. And the key idea here is uh, uh, the use of attention. So the model became extremely popular because uh, of several facts. First of all, um, researchers just found out how to parallelize uh, backpropagation of uh, neural networks in such a way that you can do it in parallel with large batches. So uh, you got an opportunity to uh, process extremely large data sets quickly. Yeah, um, you have also solved community has also solved the problem of uh, uh, overfitting, uh, not only by the dropout, but with several techniques that uh, uh, saved you from the exploding gradients and uh, gave you an opportunity to get large context. Yeah? So and this needed to just 15% uh, benchmark improvements in all classical tasks that I have mentioned in the very beginning. And of course, so the key idea here is some kind of formula written at the head of the slide. So uh, of uh, the encoder decoder model and of the attention that uh, used uh, as a step inside them. So if you have seen this picture, I guess so it's extremely well known and familiar. This is the architecture of the classical transformer model uh, where you have uh, the block uh, that takes only inputs, for example, for machine translation, we can say that uh, this is something like uh, uh, the cat is black, yeah? And you have the correct answer that the model should generate, uh, usually called output, for example, for Russian, or French, La uh, Noir. Uh, and uh, the general idea here is that you compress your input to a very, very, very small or kind of compact uh, representation of vectors. And then you try to restore your uh, information from this embedded uh, uh, context back with the decoder that gives you some outputs. Yeah, so this is the idea of encoder and decoder. And here, uh, and it existed something like eight years before the transformer model. Uh, so the difference here is that we use the attention block uh, inside our encoder and inside our decoder that gives us better results. So the idea of attention is that uh, we can parse some trainable function that gives you information which words are important for each other which words are important for our uh, text, so for, for words between our texts, and which words are important uh, for our output uh, within our input. So it can be symmetrical or not symmetrical, depending on the place where we use it. But the short uh, description here is that we look not only on single words, but on their effect on other words. And here is some semantic idea that we cannot focus on single pieces. We need to take them uh, into account as the complex system, because otherwise we will be wrong with our classification. For instance, if you will just see only uh, ear or only no uh, you may um, say that, uh, okay, most likely it's a dog, but uh, uh, when you have this picture in complex, you may guess that, oh, this may lead to an idea that this is not the dog, this is the beer, yeah? Um, so um, I guess I'll skip this picture because... Uh, because everyone will die during this explanation. Uh, just visit seminars and you will get an opportunity to die there. Uh, and uh, just jump to the idea that uh, um, the model complexity has uh, um, multiplied several times during the rise of those models because so we may say that the first kind of deep model was uh, ELMO uh, proposed uh, in 2017 and it had something like 94 million parameters yeah then uh, the boom of uh, um, transformer models started and the first GPT and uh, BERT arrived 
and they uh, had something called so BERT, one of the most popular models and used still now has something like uh, three and uh, five uh, hundred millions of parameters. Uh, and uh, um, the continuation of those models can uh, lead it to larger number of parameters that generally lead it just in uh, the rise of uh, the number of uh, uh, the, the size of your uh, vector that you store inside the model and the number of layers. So this was the main difference. Yeah. Uh, then when uh, the community understood that those models can uh, solve pretty complex tasks, uh, a large uh, 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 a dozen of models that are kind of specialized on some proper problems I had right, like BART, that is the distilled BERT model, or Roberta, that is trained in some different way, focused on question answering. And the next large step here uh, was the rise of pretty, we can say that these are almost large language models, yeah, LLMs, where they have something like billions uh, and uh, uh, tens of billions of parameters, yeah. And uh, so I do have the update of this plot, recent one with uh, uh, GPT-4, but uh, so we need to double this uh, value so that you can understand uh, um, how terrible things are. And each uh, step of this modification uh, led to better understanding of the generalized language. Um, so almost the all models that happen uh, after 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 this step are trained on multiple tasks. For example, you ask them to uh, translate something and then to classify something and then to summarize something and then something else. So it's the multitask models and um, they, due to the extremely large number of parameters, they can uh, learn almost all domains, uh, not only in one, but in all possible languages. Yeah, this is just the uh, key achievement of these extremely large models. And this led to the rise of the prompting or that we observe now. So starting from GPT-3, you have uh, uh, the possibility not to train the model, but just to ask the model to do something, considering that the model has learned almost everything that you have inside the internet, because you know, generally speaking, OpenAI has uh, loaded almost the all internet inside the model. It knows everything about the publications that arrive uh, in any area of science. It knows everything about some uh, politicians that are popular now and were popular earlier. It knows everything about, about the literature and generally everything about the society from social networks. So so we can say that it's the model that was trained on the entire internet. So the things that we need to do is not to train this model on some purpose task, but to extract this knowledge from billions of parameters of those model in the proper way. This can be done by prompting. Um, another view of this diversity of models um, can bring you some idea that uh, new models still arrive. And uh, so you cannot solve all problems only with, uh, for example, GPT-3 or a Llama assistant. Yeah. Uh, and this happens due to several conditions. The, 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 the most obvious here is that a specialized model is firstly cheaper because it doesn't require fitting on billions of parameters and secondary kind of more precise for your specialized task yeah um and i guess the second point here is that only few um companies can train a large model just from scratch and uh, not uh, a single uh, researcher 
can train can, can fine tune the model even if it is already trained because for example uh the latest gpt model or one from uh spare requires at least uh 64 gigabytes of random access memory on your gpu accelerator i guess not everyone has such configuration of the room. yeah uh, that's why so small but focused on some uh, specific uh, target models, especially the uh, classifier, the encoder models that are labeled green here are pretty popular and pretty useful. And so um, the best idea here is that you can uh, train your own small and compact model and uh, use large model that knows everything about language as some kind of the supervisor, the trainer for those models. So our second part is uh, some highlight where uh, each task that we start talking about, specification, clustering, entity recognition, uh, and linking uh, is filtered through two ideas. Can we solve this problem with uh, GPT prompting and uh, can we improve uh, our solution with uh, some uh, specific specialized model uh, and prompting? Yeah, so I guess I will stop for now and uh, stop sharing my screen. Alina, can you? Um... I hope I am heard. I can talk. Yeah. Yes, yes, everything is yes. perfect. Yes. Oh. Uh, I will be telling uh, you about how to use uh, ChatGPT to directly solve the problems we were talking about previously and how to create data sets so you can train your own small comp compact model. So we will start with the text classification. Um, so on the left, you can see the example of prompt. You can just uh, say to the GPT what categories you have. If you name them, it will be very useful for it. Uh, and then you will just give some information and um, ChatGPT does classification task pretty well. Uh, as you can see in the third sentence, we were trying to uh, trick the model. The, saying the word child, though Savannah uh, is an adult and she should be classified as an adult. So uh, this is uh, how you can uh, generate your data set for classification task. Um, well, you basically can uh, just uh, say that you have such categories and ask to uh, create sentences for each of the categories. Uh, and you should do that for as many times as big you want your data set to be. Um, another decision is to um, generate uh, each class separately and say uh, GPT to generate several text about one thematic. You can choose either way you like. Uh, I think it depends on how many classes you know you have and on other stuff. So, um, uh, this, this is, is a, a uh, yeah, this is my picture. So the, the, the idea here is that if you take a look at the classical uh, sentiment detection uh, data set that as we have highlighted earlier is the typical uh, text classification task, uh, you can see that for all data sets that we can see here, including MDB, SST, and Amazon Review, uh, the best models that are at the uh, third column, yeah, like T5 and very large, are uh, not GPT driver. So first of all, uh, the classification task is really um, easier solved by the encoder models. If we uh, jump back to the picture of the transformer architecture, uh, Alina, can you do it for, for us? Yeah, wait a second. Um, it doesn't want to go back. Oh, yeah, I know. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, just, just 
large flesh mm -hmm. back yeah so yeah. uh and when no yeah so you have a uh, kind of two pieces of this model the left one is the encoder and the right one is the decoder and this is the classical transformer so when we're dealing uh, with uh, different models uh we can split this classical architecture on several pieces for instance uh, most of the BERT models that we have mentioned several times already is only the left part of, of this picture where uh, on the left part of the picture where we have just the inputs and our uh, some final label as a result and all uh, large language models like gpt and llama are mostly focused uh, are mostly based on the right part of this model so we're uh, only training them to generate you next the uh, next uh, word or next block of text yeah and we're not doing the uh, encoding process uh, and uh, uh, left uh, part driven models are really good in classification because they are kind of focused on encoding the entire information into one single point one one or okay uh several vectors that store the entire information about this text about this uh, uh, object that you are uh, trying to encode and it's it pretty easy to fine-tune them on the classification task so that's why uh most of the traditional uh, uh problems where you need to to pick some uh label among others or for example to do clustering is by design better solved by uh, the traditional methods even in the uh, 2023rd yeah uh, from another point of view uh, uh, problems uh, based uh, on generation like uh, machine translation or those uh, kind of detoxication tasks or summarization tasks where you need to synthesize text are uh, better solved by uh, the right part of uh, this model or by the generative gpt driven models so obviously uh, for um, if you want to synthesize something you it's more useful to use uh, gpt like model uh, and uh, this doesn't mean that you cannot uh, combine them because uh, uh, one of the most uh, uh, popular recipes uh, that uh, uh, can be observed in recent uh, uh, conference proceedings, we can jump back to the papers with code slide, uh, is uh, the idea of uh, uh, giving additional examples and, and the next one, please. Oh, sorry <laughs> now we're in a real life seminar yeah we, we, we ask for the next slide uh, can, can you jump to the next one or yeah so this is the example of the recent dialogue uh, competition uh for sentiment detection happened just uh, two or three months ago and uh you can see the leaderboard where uh Okay, so you need to read the full article, but the idea here is that uh, the first participant hasn't used uh, uh, large language uh, GPT-based models in their solution uh, and got a state-of-the-art result. And the same is happening in uh, papers with code where we observe uh, several data sets and all best solutions are uh, not using any uh, um, GPT-based models. But from other point of view, uh, the second and the third uh, participants of this competition has used uh, GPT model just as the trainer for their uh, encoder and generated additional examples with uh, GPT and uh, asked GPT to return the proper label uh, for text classification. So they just ask, what is the sentiment of this text or of this text? And they augmented the entire data set with additional examples and got better results that gave them the idea, uh, the, the, the opportunity to get at least to the second and third places of this linear board. Uh, and another example here is uh, from the same conference uh, that is more or less 
useful because so um, people are competing within the Russian uh, language and uh, most likely at least so most of uh, the audience are working with Russian language here is uh, the uh, artificial text detection. So the, the task of the competition was to detect if the task uh, is the text was written by uh, the computer or not. And you can see here uh, that uh, the best solution uh, used just the uh, weighted uh, ensemble uh, of several models. Uh, and uh, so in spite of well, the fact that all models here are uh, encoder based, so you can see that they're uh, Roberta, Baird, Bart, and so on, uh, you can do the same trick with the GPT based model. So first of all, uh, you can ask several different models and one of the hints uh, used uh, by the uh, guys from the sentiment detection data set was to use the same model, but to give it different inputs. For instance, they have translated uh, the text to English and asked uh, the model what is the sentiment of the translated text. And uh, you can combine the uh, input for Russian and for English. And you can combine input for, uh, for example, um, GPT and uh, uh, GigaChat and then just make some kind of weighted classifier that solves your problem better. So uh, we can say that, first of all, uh, no uh, just pure GPT uh, models uh, or pure GPT prompts give you uh, state-of-the-art results during the competitions. Yeah, so most of those competitions, especially when we're talking about classification, NAIR, and so on, uh, are uh, won by the classical encoder models. Uh, but assembling models and using GPT inside them as the trainer, as the augmenter of your data set, leads to better results. Uh, I guess we can move on with... Uh, mm -hmm. Our presentation. So uh, the next task is the text clustering. It's really tricky because uh, as we saw in the beginning, the main question is how many clusters are you going to have? So ChatGPT um, usually as at our first attempt to prompt ChatGPT for this task, it always just gave each sentence its own cluster and just separated everything and didn't make any groups. Uh, we also tried it with a little uh, simple example of words uh, because words uh, seem to be easier to classify. And well, some clustering has been done. However, we were not really happy with the result because we would uh, expect bread and peach, for example, both be food and we are not really happy with the naming of one cluster where the person is because it's named profession. The person isn't a profession exactly. However, we found a way how to uh, prompt clustering task well. So uh, uh, here uh, you... Uh, 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 hey, can, can, can I just make a small stop here because uh, maybe yeah, sure. people in the room uh has not focused on the key problem of clustering so the gpt is uh, the kind of uh, uh the small window that you can put text one by one and clustering by design is the task where you need to look uh, uh, through all examples simultaneously to understand what's similar between them and what are the differences yeah and it it is really hard to, 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 to explain GPT that you wanted to look at all examples first and then to give some answer. Yeah, so actually sorry we, for the disclaimer. Actually, we really tried to do exactly this. Uh, so I tried to write in the prompt, look at the, first, read the sentences and then cluster them. I tried that approach. However, it didn't work out. So uh, as you can see, this is a uh, this um, this is not working. So 
Yes, as Ilya said, uh, the main problem is that algorithm has to see all texts before clustering them because we don't know how many clusters we want and we need to analyze whole data before we do something about it. So how do we make ChatGPT look at the data before clustering? Um, the ChatGPT uh, is very interesting in that it remembers everything that happens within one chat we are having with it. So we can just first give, me, give him only the text. We are making him read everything without telling him what to do about it. And it will be focused on the text you are giving to him, not on the task, which is really good for us in this case. So we tried to just simply make him read the sentences we uh, tried to cluster. And it has done a really good job. Well, it's a little messy output, to be honest, because the numeration is weird, <laughs> but well, and we didn't have any output preferences, so we will just leave it uh, like this at the moment. But you can um, make the output look the way you want it. Uh, but we think that it is possible uh, that this chat can remember only a restricted amount of uh, info. So if you are trying to cluster big uh, amount of data, um, you will probably run, run into the problem of not having enough chat GPT memory. Uh, so uh, so we, sh uh, we think that clustering problem is solvable but with chat GPT, however, with some restrictions. Um, so how do we make data set for text clustering with normal models? We just make it as for classification and then just delete all the labels. So the model will not know how many of them they are, there are, and it will have to learn to detect the number of these clusters. Um, the next task is uh, named entity recognition. Uh, and uh, direct solution is also quite well working. Here we can also say, uh, also tell ChatGPT to um, take away each entity only once, even if it's paraphrased, which is a really good um, thing. Not every model can do. Um, and as for the dataset generation, uh, we can um, give it name of uh, entities, named entities, and uh, make it uh, generated text. So now we have um, pairs, text and list of named entities. And this is the data set that our model will comprehend and will learn on very well. Um, also, uh, let's look at the relation extraction problem. Um, for example, we will give it uh, such little text. I took it from Wikipedia. It's about Paddington. Um, and uh, we can directly ask what are the relations between the British geographer and the bears? And it will pretty well extract relations in um, maybe uh, too, <laughs> too much information will be given, but we can uh, extract it somehow with regular expressions, for example. Um, so this is one option. Another option, if you want some more structured data, you can ask for a better output and it will be as you wish, um, separated by uh, enhypens in this case. Uh, so. Yeah, as for the Russian text, you can do something similar and just uh, ask to generate uh, the triplets. So the structure where you have object relation and subject is called triplet. Uh, and uh, you can see that for kind of typical structured text for Wikipedia, everything is working pretty well, unless uh, you're satisfied with the categories that uh, GPT considers important. In case when you want uh, to change the category, for example, uh, you don't want to see uh, the relation or 
Produce and board, yeah. Uh, but want to see the the, the, the relation. For example, uh, has visited, yeah. Because if person has born in Moscow, most likely he has visited Moscow, yeah. Uh, and so you want to modify your generalized taxonomy. Uh, you can either do it with prompting and explain that you want to use these these relations, or after all, train your own model with your own entities and relations and use uh, GPT as the generator of your data set that you're going to use for training. Uh, I guess uh, we maybe, have the maybe, next slide about it. Uh, well, I have one more idea about this. We can also probably um, classify cluster types of links, the relations, and also get some interesting results. But yeah, sure. So, also, um, how we would generate data set for a relation extraction. Uh, we can also give um, ChatGPT uh, relations and ask to make text. Uh, the most important idea here is to ask to generate one sentence for each uh, prompt, for each, like, this little string of relation. Because if you do not do this, it will generate a long, long, long story with many, many, many relations, and the point will be lost because you will have a pair of text and of relations, but most of the relations of the text will not be instructed into in, extracted into this massive, and this will lose the whole point. So you have to really uh, make each relation correspond to one sentence. Yeah, we don't hear you. Sorry, too many uh, devices. Uh, this is an example for Russian uh, text generation where you can see uh, the prompt and the final dialogue. So you can even generate pretty long dialogues. Uh, the problem here is that sometimes uh, you get your model hallucinating. For instance, you can see that we have some fake uh, bank account at uh, the bottom of our text, but uh, uh, and th 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 this may be a problem because uh, good uh, entity uh, linking and narrow extraction um, system would uh, take this information and would highlight it but you don't have it at your original um, knowledge graph or, and uh, this would be considered as a mistake that's why you need to be pretty careful while generating and to stop the model from generating some fake data as uh, Alina has just explained Yeah, and uh, all the same thing with uh, Soto here. Uh, you can see that uh, starting from 2021, um, there are no models that uh, show better results uh, than, than this uh, ACE with large document context model. Um, and uh, the best uh, kind of prompt-based model uh, has a pretty high score, but uh, still worse uh, than uh, the state of the art. Uh, and uh, I'll highlight it uh, once again. So uh, uh, nowadays in 2023, um, I haven't seen the competition uh, where the prompt based or just GPT driven model uh, beats uh, the classical models uh, for uh, the tasks that were focused on in this presentation. But uh, most likely, uh, you can get a pretty strong baseline uh, that you can use uh, as some kind of quick result in your research, uh, or uh, you can use the GPT model to solve the problem more accurate with uh, the traditional models. Yeah, can move on. Uh, and uh, coming back to how we can generate data set for relation extraction, um, 
So the second part from relation extraction to synthetic text, we have just discussed it. And uh, so you can not make uh, relations by yourself because it's pretty boring and uh, long task. Uh, we would like to automate uh, automate it as well. Uh, we can extract uh, relations with JetGPT from the real text. And then based on the uh, relations, because it will not be all relations that will be in the text because ChatGPT isn't perfect as well. We will make it generate synthetic taste, uh, text based on these relations it has in, in extracted. And this is the main key. Like you just automate the whole process. And I think it's a really beautiful idea. And the same uh, can be done for named entity recognition that we has, have also talked about. So I guess this is the takeaway message that Ya yeah, has highlighted uh, for several times, that it's a good, um, ChatGPT is a good baseline. It solves problems quite well, as you have seen. Uh, but you could uh, aim for an even better result um, if you use ChatGPT as a teacher. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and the hidden message here is that uh, uh, so you shouldn't ignore GPT prompts because they're useful and they can make give you an opportunity to get an ad hoc research. But uh, if you really want to be a strong data scientist, most likely you shouldn't stop on them and you should spend some time learning traditional models and the architecture behind them uh, because uh, some guy uh, at the same interview will get better results just because he knows these methods and you don't. And uh, so it would be a key difference. And uh, his results would be great just because he can train his specialized model. And um, we are having uh, the course about uh, training deep learning models uh, inside our uh, program. So just join us and uh, learn not only prompts, but uh, advanced methods for model training. Yes, uh, I Irina, I, I, I guess we're done. And yes. uh, <laughs> it was okay, a small okay, advertising. Yes. Here. Uh -huh, thank you. Thank you very much. So, yes, that was a small piece of advertisement for the program. So, yes, um, we have a question <laughs> in the chat from, yes. So, uh, is it a question or it's a statement? So, artificial intelligence will not replace the researchers. Absolutely so, <laughs> absolutely so. And we are really excited to tell you that, yes. Yes, but uh, to be such a researcher who will not be replaced by AI, you need to learn, yes, <laughs> some methods, methodologies. Well, uh, okay, thank you. Thank you very much to our speakers. Maybe we have some additional questions from our participants. Mm-hmm. Okay. So no questions. Uh evening time.